Hidden among one of the world's most productive agricultural areas is one of the most endangered ecosystems in North America. Many of the plants and animals that make their home in the arid San Joaquin Valley of California are found nowhere else on the planet. Join us as we explore the fascinating diversity of the animals and plants of the San Joaquin Valley and look at ways to protect this fragile ecosystem. Central California's San Joaquin Valley stretches over 200 miles from Stockton to Bakersfield. This vast ecosystem, sandwiched between the coastal mountain ranges and the high Sierra Nevada, supports an enormous abundance and diversity of wildlife hidden among the farms, cities, and oil fields. But many of these unique plants and animals are endangered, and their future is in jeopardy. Loss of these natural areas to cities and farms is the major threat to the valley's wildlife. But even the early European settlers vastly changed the landscape by an unforeseen menace they brought with them, plants from back home. Dr. Brian Seifer, a wildlife ecologist with the Endangered Species Recovery Program, is one of the leading experts on the region's wildlife. In the 1800s, as um, the Spaniards did colonize California and brought their cattle in, a lot of Mediterranean plants, particularly grasses, did get introduced to this area. And since it does have a Mediterranean climate, those grasses found the area quite to their liking and really are now the dominant component in the ground cover. When we get these dry years like this, then very little grass comes up. And then we, we probably see what this area did probably look like under historic conditions. But down in the southern part of the valley here, these, these probably indeed were arid shrublands, historically for the most part. Although shrublands dominated the valley, desert grassland and prairie are most common in areas with greater rainfall. This is a very common and extremely abundant non-native grass. This Dr. Polly Schiffman, a plant ecologist at the California State University at Northridge, has been studying native plants in California's grasslands and prairies. If you can sort of imagine this ecosystem without the invasives, um, but just the native plants, that's what it would have been like. We have so many of uh, the non-natives, the invasives, they take up all the space, and now the natives um, that might have been um, more dominant if the invaders weren't there are, are kind of pushed to the sidelines, so to speak. At this place, it would have been a smattering of bunch grasses with wildflowers of various kinds, with, you know, patches of yellow and patches of lavender and little things here and there. The San Joaquin Valley is unique in having so many plants and animals found nowhere else, what biologists call endemic species. Scientists believe this happened because the surrounding mountains separated plants and animals from their closest relatives. Adaptations of these species through millions of years created the unique plants and animals that we see today. Nowhere in the San Joaquin Valley is there such abundance and diversity of endangered wildlife as in the Carrizo Plain National Monument. The Carrizo is the largest remaining refuge for many of the endangered plants and animals in arid habitats of the vast San Joaquin ecosystem. If it's not the spring, it looks pretty dry and brown and, and desolate, but it's, there's just tremendous biological diversity here, but you have to know how to look at it. You really have to take your time and, you know, get down on your hands and knees sometimes and look at stuff. It can kind of be hidden if you don't take the time to, to really watch. Giant kangaroo rats are one of those hidden creatures. In fact, they're not really rats at all, but highly specialized rodents adapted for arid environments. They have a complex social life that revolves around a system of burrows called a precinct. Here, they signal to their neighbors by drumming their feet on the ground. Rats 
Dr. Laura Pru, a conservation biologist at the University of California, Berkeley, studies how giant kangaroo rats interact with their environment. Kangaroo rats are really an incredible species. Basically little farmers, they have these mounds where they have a lot of burrows and, and just a really extensive system of tunnels underneath. They harvest their seeds and clip all the vegetation on their mounds. They dry their seeds in what we call haystacks. And then once the seeds are dried, they bring them down into basically underground silos. So they have seed caches underground. That helps them make it through drought years out here. So that has a really strong effect on the plants. There's a lot of soil disturbance. As the kangaroo rat works through the night, it must watch out for predators like the San Joaquin kit fox that prowls through the precincts hunting for unwary prey. The San Joaquin kit fox, a small cousin of the coyote, is no bigger than a house cat. Where you tend to have the best uh, kit fox populations are where you, you do have concentrations of kangaroo rats. Kit foxes are, are basically a, a desert adapted species. So they have a, a number of adaptations which help them survive in a, a very arid environment like this. Out in these arid habitats, dens are kind of a premium for a number of different species. Kit foxes generally will actually kind of expand on a, a kangaroo rat burrow or a ground squirrel burrow or even a badger dig and expand that into a den. Pups are born right about mid-February. And then at about um, six weeks or so, you do see the pups kind of coming above ground, uh, usually for brief periods. In the areas where there's good quality habitat left, the kit foxes are actually doing fairly well. The problem is there aren't very many of those areas. The main reason they are endangered is habitat loss and degradation throughout the San Joaquin Valley. Probably somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of their, their good quality habitat is now gone. It's been converted to agricultural uses, urban uses, and industrial uses. And unfortunately that, that trend is continuing. You know, every year there's still several thousand acres of habitat that are just dis disappearing. Habitat is also rapidly disappearing for another burrow dwelling animal the chipmunk-sized San Joaquin antelope squirrel. Although it's still abundant in a few large, undeveloped areas, it's gone from many of the smaller ones. Antelope squirrels need specific desert-like conditions to survive. When invasive grasses become too dense during wet years, these small mammals are forced to find other open areas. The impressive western rattlesnake is one of the main predators of these ground squirrels. They are one of the most familiar snakes in even small, undeveloped areas. They locate their prey by sensing their victim's heat with organs located between their nostril and eye. After their initial venomous attack, rattlesnakes track their victims down by tasting the air with their forked tongue. They often remain still to avoid being seen, but their rattle provides a clear warning signal when danger comes too near. Like many other creatures here, rattlesnakes seek refuge underground in burrows made by kangaroo rats and other burrow diggers. Even as the ecosystem changes and development pushes further into natural areas, it's still possible to make exciting new discoveries, sometimes literally right at the edge of town. There's some tracks. Doctors Ted Pappenfuss and James Parham, research biologists, are studying what might turn out to be a newly identified species of legless lizards that is found only in the southwestern part of the valley, providing even more reason to ensure protection for these interesting creatures. There. Got one. How exciting. Just right on the surface in lots and lots of tracks. What's really cool about something like this legless lizard is that here we find it in this little tiny patch of habitat between a railroad and a, some sort of factory. And probably the great majority of people that live in Bakersfield have no idea that they have a unique thing literally right in their backyard. Legless lizards are one of the truly unique reptiles of the San Joaquin Valley. They are rarely seen because they spend the majority of their lives underground. 
Worm-like in appearance, with tiny eyes that rarely see the light, they are found only in loose soil, where they bury themselves so quickly they seem to almost disappear. I think for something like the legless lizard, since they have a presumably a very small home range, they can probably persist in areas of maybe as few as a, you know, 10 meters on each side, as long as the area has not been plowed over. Once the area is plowed, of course, that will uh, destroy the habitat and also, you know, kill the legless lizards. But small natural areas, like I said, even among oil wells, as long as there's some natural habitat between the oil wells, it seems that the legless lizards do quite well. But that isn't true for many of the endangered wildlife. The blunt-nosed leopard lizard is found only in larger natural areas, having been pushed out by development. These lizards are one of the most beautiful and highly endangered lizard species in California. After a long dormancy underground in mammal burrows, adults emerge in spring. Scurrying around the sparse, arid vegetation, they employ speed to catch their prey. But in areas that have grown over with dense plants, the lizards are unable to move quickly and become prey themselves. Often called horny toads because of their appearance, the coast horned lizard is one of the most unusual reptiles with amazing adaptations for avoiding predation. These ant-eating lizards use the horns on their head for protection. And when predators threaten, they may get hit with a stream of blood the lizard shoots from the corners of its eyes. But even with bizarre defenses and blazing speed, small reptiles often fall prey to one of the San Joaquin Valley's most charismatic owls. Burrowing owls hunt both night and day, catching a surprising variety of other animals, including reptiles. The valley has one of the largest populations of these owls. Unlike any other owl in North America, they lay their eggs underground, almost exclusively in mammal burrows. The female incubates the eggs, which usually hatch in four weeks. After hatching, the chicks are entirely helpless. They weigh less than half an ounce and are unable to see and can't even move around on their own until they are five days old. Owlets as young as 10 days old can be seen as they emerge from their burrows, eager to be fed when their parents return with food. In wetter years, food resources are more abundant and these owls may raise as many as 10 owlets, so you can imagine the amount of food they have to bring to their nest to keep the growing young satisfied. When the winter rains come, an entirely different ecosystem takes shape. Winter rain gives rise to small bodies of water called vernal pools. Although these areas may have been completely dry for years, aquatic animals almost magically appear when the rains arrive. The western spadefoot toad is amazingly adapted for vernal pools. Once sufficient rains arrive, spadefoot toads emerge from their almost year-long dormancy underground. They waste no time breeding immediately and laying eggs that hatch in one day. These tadpoles have the extraordinary ability to develop into toads in as little as three weeks, allowing them to escape the unpredictable drying of their aquatic habitat. We'll just kind of do a transect across here. This is how we do reconnaissance so that we catch every pool. Many organizations and agencies keep a careful watch over the endangered critters of vernal pools. Each winter, Michelle Selman, a biologist with the California Department of Fish and Game, trains technicians to identify and monitor endangered species that live in vernal pools, like the vernal pool tadpole shrimp. These shrimp have changed little in appearance from fossils dating back two million years. Tadpole shrimp prey upon another endangered crustacean, the vernal pool fairy shrimp. These crustaceans have adapted to the unpredictable nature of their vernal pool habitat by producing cysts that can survive decades without water. Cysts are embryos contained within a special shell that disperse by wind and by animals such as these American avocets. Once a vernal pool refills, the cysts hatch and begin another cycle of life. With generosity and foresight, 
many individuals and organizations have worked to protect vernal pools. Local land trusts, which are organizations that protect habitat through purchase or conservation easements, have come together with landowners to protect what is now the Herbert Wetland Prairie Preserve. Rob Hansen, a local ecologist, has been working to restore this wetland and prairie with a team of biologists and community members. We're standing on really the last sizable piece of land in this part of our county that has any vernal pools on it. This one is a, it's a 700 plus acre piece of ground that sits in the middle of what once was this, at our best measurement about 100,000 acres of vernal pool land. So way less than 1% still here. Loss of habitat is the greatest cause for the disappearance of native plants and wildlife in the valley. Setting aside undeveloped properties like the Herbert Preserve is a key component in reversing that trend. Steve Juarez, a biologist with the California Department of Fish and Game, has worked towards developing a network of conservation sites in the valley. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. You've got to have continuity of properties. You've got to have a number of places where these species can, can exist so that the failure of one doesn't constitute a total loss. This is Button Willow Ecological Reserve. It's one of several that, that are on the San Joaquin Valley floor. This one is particularly important to us because it's our stronghold for blunt-nosed leopard lizard. When you're talking about the vast majority of, of the valley floor being converted into agricultural urban uses, you take what you can get. And hopefully it's in a, in a large enough block to um, be able to allow those species to continue on that property. Although that's always a challenge. You never know whether or not you've got enough because you can have any, any catastrophic event occur on a property that, that puts that population at risk. This is the biodiversity in the, in the San Joaquin Valley is in little places like this. Land trusts and public agencies have purchased many parcels of undeveloped habitat in order to develop a network of conservation sites. Even with this network, little of the valley floor remains protected today, and many of these are isolated, making it hard for animals to move from one protected area to another, which is important for long-term conservation. Scientists are working together with land managers to learn how animals use habitat that connects protected areas. Using radio telemetry, researchers are able to learn more about how animals roam. We've conducted a series of studies on kit foxes in this area, um, as well as all throughout the San Joaquin Valley. And the focus of all of our studies is just to, you know, gain as much information as we can about their life history, um, particularly the demographic patterns, you know, their survival rates, reproductive rates, and how those are affected by other factors, whether it be human disturbance or just environmental conditions. Um, so, and then we want to use that information to develop conservation strategies, and that could be everything from, you know, managing the habitat, um, trying reintroduction programs, or increasing artificial dens. Habitat conservation really is the key to conserving and recovering these guys. Many of the controversies regarding management of preserves exist because of the complex relationships of its species. But inventive experiments are underway that will help clarify how management tools, such as cattle grazing and controlled fire, affect native plants and animals that the preserves were meant to protect. The main point of the study is to look at how kangaroo rats are affecting the other species in the system and also how cattle affect the kangaroo rats. Grazing is used on the monument to keep the invasive grasses from getting too thick, but there's some controversy about whether it's detrimental to kangaroo rats and other native plants and native species. So we've built a series of exclosures to tease out the effects of cattle and kangaroo rats on the other species. 
While it is too early to say what this new study will show us, other researchers have demonstrated that at least under certain conditions, grazing can be a useful tool for reducing the density of invasive grasses that can cause havoc for many of the endangered plants and animals. But grazing is not always good. Several other studies reported that the abundance of many species of native plants and giant kangaroo rats were actually lower in grazed areas. The research Dr. Prue is conducting will help us better understand the conditions when grazing is useful or detrimental. Although grazing remains an important tool for managing vegetation, some areas still retain the desired vegetation even without grazing, adding to the puzzle of where, when, and how to manage the problem of invasive plants. As Larry Sasla, a wildlife biologist with the Bureau of Land Management in Bakersfield, California, describes. This is ideal habitat. Um, there's plenty of food sources. It's great soils for burrowing, but they're not hindered by the, um, the sea of non-native grasses. If we had a, a vision of what we thought we'd like to manage for, this type of a site, I think, would, would, meet, the, um, would meet that vision. Scientists and managers are still exploring the controversial issue of how to best manage land to obtain this ideal vegetation structure. There's really no 100% right answer or 100% wrong answer. Um, I'm not going to say that grazing is good everywhere, and I'm certainly not going to say grazing is bad everywhere. I've seen it for my entire career where if it's not grazed, you lose those species out of that property. They'll eventually wink out. Grazing appears to be a, a good tool when prescribed in the right way. Uh, grazing can eliminate biomass and open up the habitats for these sweet species, um, especially leopard lizards that didn't evolve with a thick sea of grass. Um, and we've definitely seen it hinder their movements what we're trying to do is um, apply science and, and our state of knowledge uh, to see how grazing can be used and be an appropriate tool to meet our landscape objectives, which is to help us conserve and recover the endangered species of the San Joaquin Valley. Fire can be a tool, but fire can eliminate some of the native plants that we're trying to manage as well. The idea being that if you time the fire uh, appropriately, you might be able to reduce the uh, cover of non-native invasive plants and promote uh, native species. It's unlikely that historically fire was a significant factor in this ecosystem because there isn't that much fuel. So fire probably was not a regular disturbance in this, this ecosystem on a large scale, but that doesn't mean that we can't use it as a tool. But what it does mean is that we don't know necessarily if the, the organisms here are well adapted to dealing with, with fire on a, a frequent basis. Results and opinions differ, not only on the effectiveness of fire and grazing, but also on where one is better to use than the other. If you look at the vegetation here, it's, it's really a lot of different heights. It's a lot of different species. Bobby Kamansky has studied the effects of both for his thesis research at Fresno State. So my research on this preserve uh, amounted to studying how both plants and animals in and around vernal pools respond to grazing, uh, rotational cattle grazing, and prescribed fire disturbances. Grazing provides a continuous yet moderate disturbance that can, can enhance the species diversity, uh, though it can also reduce the native plant cover, while prescribed fire provides a one-time disturbance that pro provides a tremendous amount of growing space. Controversies will continue to exist on how best to manage vegetation in these complex ecosystems that differ from place to place and from year to year. With the tools developed from research at small and large preserves, methods for protecting the unique plants and animals of the valley have greater promise for developing a successful conservation network. 
Because of all these efforts, the San Joaquin Valley is still home to many species found nowhere else on Earth. But for the endangered plants and animals, the work is not done. Lying hidden in plain view, evolving on their own for millions of years, the amazing life forms of this valley may one day be lost. If we choose to take a closer look, we'll discover a fascinating world full of plants and animals worthy of continued study, care, and protection.